Hello watch enthusiasts! The luminescence of a watch is something that a lot of us take for granted, with Luminova being a very standard aspect of the vast majority of sports watches on the market, admittedly with varying levels of, um, of quality and de luminosity in terms of, um, of brightness as well as longevity. I do feel that uh, this, is, this is an aspect of watches which is often neglected and actually to a new buyer can be a tad confusing. But likewise, the history of this is also very interesting in terms of the ways mankind has tried to produce um, ways of, of making a, a watch that's legible at night, or indeed in the dark. And so as a result, today I'd like to speak about this, uh, this subject, from the earlier um, styles of, of, lumin of luminescence in the form of radium, all the way to the present day with our, our very complex compounds of luminova, providing a, a glow which is both safe and bright. Now the story of this begins really in 1898, with the discovery of radium by, by Marion Pierre Curie. And this sparked the start of a, an obsession at the start of the 20th century with the use of, of radium in, uh, in everything from cosmetics to, uh, um, to technical applications such as gun sights and indeed watch dials later on. And this was only uh, accelerated by their isolation of it uh, through the use of electrolysis in 1911 which meant that this was just in time for the First World War, and as a result, a lot of equipment during the First World War was designed specifically to work with this, especially when the First World War took a turn towards trench warfare, where warfare would take place at all times of day, and as a result, legibility on a pocket watch, for example, was absolutely crucial. Now, the impact of the importance of this, this highly legible equipment is seen immediately, and by 1916, Panerai had released on the 23rd of March their Radiomir um, radium-based paint, and this could be applied to instruments and dials alike. And watches at this stage were still in their, their early days, bearing in mind the fact that during the 1890s, the, uh, the first uh, campaign watches, which were fundamentally simply pocket watches, which were soldered to, to lugs, um, which could be worn on the wrist, were, were still, uh, still relatively new. And these only just started to, to feature a sort of luminescence on them, and, and certainly this was seen because of the trenches, but also because of use in aviation, where one needed cockpit instruments that would be legible at all times. So as a result, radium was, was an extremely important part of this. And the 1917 release of Undark showed this, this technology to the general public, and became an aspect which became ever more important in the public eye. Undark was a product of the US Radium Corporation and, and was a piece of, of technology whereby uh, a type of paint was made through the use of radium and also zinc sulphide, which, uh, which was excited by the alpha particles being emitted by the radium itself. And as a result, this, uh, this glowed very brightly and blue. And as a result, this was used on clock faces, on gauges, um, and even this article says, even on, on, uh, on buttons, um, on electric push buttons, and buckles, for example, in order to be able to find your way about in the dark, which show all sorts of imaginative uses, bearing in mind the fact that the, the negative effects of this still weren't fully understood. Now, it should be noted that thanks to the, the lack of knowledge on the subject, and the fact that people did genuinely believe that radium was a health benefit and was genuinely helpful to the, uh, the, the welfare of people who had it, it did rise, as has been said by various people, to a point where actually it was the most expensive uh, material in the world, um, as far as, um, or, or as, as chemicals went, weight for weight. And this found its way into a great deal of different places, notably cosmetics, for example, um, whereby a lot of people were, uh, were applying radium, or at least highly diluted radium cosmetics to themselves. Now, usually this wasn't a problem, because the cosmetics were so dilute as a result of the immense price of radium that there was very, very little to, to actually harm the people who consumed them, though, of course, this was hardly a healthy practice. It wasn't lethal, at least uh, for most people, it wasn't lethal. However, it was in dial painting in the 1920s and 30s that the danger really started to rise. And during this period, dials were painted by hand. They were painted with a paintbrush, um, as is still the case with some, uh, some dial manufacturers today. However, of course, they were painting using radium um, or radium compounds as their paint, which was incredibly potent stuff. Um, and whilst the vast majority of, of radium cosmetics, for example, didn't glow at all and were purely um, using the term radium as a, a sales um, marketing pitch, here, this was genuinely potent uh, compound, which could put out alpha particles in, in baffling quantities. Now, because radium has a half-life of 1600 years, its, uh, its radiation output doesn't change really during a person's life, or at least during their, their, their use and, and exposure to the, 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 to, uh, to the element. And as it decays to radon, it releases alpha particles, which is to say uh, he helium nuclei. And these um, attempt to, to rip electrons from, from surrounding atoms, um, and as a result are extremely highly ionising. 
and this has has a disastrous effect on on human beings um, if if exposed to these um, uh, these the, to this these particles for extended periods of time, and this starts to be the case with the people who were known as the the radium girls, and these were women who were tasked with painting dials in in factories. And who would um, who would paint using a paintbrush, as I've said, um, the the surface of of dials with this particular compound of paint. The problem was that in order to 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 point their brushes, they would uh, dip them on their tongue or indeed uh, their lips in order to be able to uh, to make the brushes as fine as possible and to be able to paint more more accurately. The issue was with this was that over time they would they would ingest the the radium. And as a result, this would have a, a whole host of disastrous uh, consequences on the on the, the the victim. For a start, this would uh, this would cause necrosis in the mouth, um, which is a, a nasty business, as well as tumours, um, and then uh, a disastrous uh, situation whereby their their bones would start to come apart because radium is absorbed in a similar way to calcium. And so, as a result, this is why some of these uh, these individuals reported glowing in the dark because their bones themselves were absorbing the radium. Now, quite clearly, this period had to end, and certainly as people's awareness towards this um, this this awful uh, maltreatment of, of workers was becoming more and more uh, more and more significant, litigation ensued, and as a result, in 1937 and in the late 1930s in general, court cases were held against the manufacturers, and uh, and this style of manufacturing was was reduced enormously in terms of the amount uh, amount done. And this meant that really by the 1960s, this, um, this use of, of, of uh, radium had been reduced enormously to about a hundredth of its original concentration when used on dials. Now, due to their military connection, Panerai continued using this in quite vast quantities until 1949. And in 1949, they came up with a new technology, which was Luminor. And Luminor was really the, the obvious successor to, uh, to radium. And this was tritium-based. And this was a, a tritium-based type of uh, of paint, which which it, it itself is a uh, hydrogen three, so it's a hydrogen isotope, which is a beta particle emitter. And these beta particles are far far less potent, though admittedly they can get through um, thicker materials in terms of of uh, shielding. It certainly is still true to say that uh, a watch case is more than significant enough to stop these particles from um, from causing any lasting harm to a wearer. This is why actually there isn't any concern with wearing, for example, a, a vintage Rolex or something like that, because actually the half life of tritium is significantly shorter as well, with a half life of 12.32 years which means that really by about 25 years into the lifespan of these um, these watches, the dials were no longer functional in terms of glowing, which did reduce the risk to the wearer significantly. And likewise, these were used with a zinc sulphide base in order to be able to, to glow, this time more of a greeny colour than the original blue seen on uh, seen on, on radium dials. But um, these, these were certainly a, a move in the right direction in terms of reducing the potency of this, um, this use of, of radioactive materials. Interestingly, one could actually argue that the need for, for Luminor was most acute for Panerai, because of course, as of 1938, they produced dials in the sandwich style, whereby they would paint a lower plate placed beneath the dial um, with uh, originally um, a radium, and as a result, this, uh, this would significantly increase the amount of radium on the dial, and thus the radioactivity of the watch as a whole. Now, radium's final removal from the market is seen in 1964, and this is because in Switzerland, in October 1963, the Swiss government created a set of permissible radio, uh, watch radioactivities, um, with certain allowances admittedly made for technical watches if they needed more luminescence. However, on the whole, they now regulated the radioactivity of a watch, um, and as a result, uh, uh, sales were restricted depending upon on how these were presented. And this was finally enforced on January 1964 and really didn't mark the end of radium. This is why at this point we see we see a Rolex um, signing at the bottom of the dial, now with Swiss and a T on either side, or T and then uh, less than 25, which is uh, a reference to the, the, ra the radioactivity which is allowed, and stating that the watch is within those regulations. Now tritium works in much the same way as radium, in that it's painted onto the dial um, in addition to uh, another chemical, often zilk sulphide, which allowed uh, uh, allowed its its beta particles, which were emitted by it, which are electrons rather than being the alpha particles, which are in truth helium uh, nuclei that were emitted by the radium, would uh, would excite the uh, that that additional uh, additive and thus create a, a certain colour and and bright um, uh, display of the the time in the dark, and in the same way, this didn't require any sort of charging. You would simply put it in the dark and it would glow for the the, uh, the 25 or so years it would last with that half-life of 12.32 years.
And this is often quite a good way of telling whether a dial has been re-illumed or not, because of course a watch from the 1960s, which uh, which was produced um, with that that tritium uh, luminescence, will no longer be luminous today. So if a vintage watch is lit up like a Christmas tree when you put it in the dark, then there's a very very good chance that it's been it's been re-illumed with either modern luminova or indeed it's been reapplied with tritium. The next development came in 1988 when a, uh, a, a set of research was being produced on the radioactivity of, of military watches. And military watches were pieces which didn't necessarily have to adhere to the levels of radioactivity which others did, and, and as a result, they were significantly more radioactive. And these did still use tritium, but it was noticed that when these were transported, or at least stored in very large quantities, the radioactive signature of these was very substantial. And so as a result, work commenced on trying to find a solution to this. And whilst this was a problem which was specifically found by the US Army, um, this is something which has now been applied to a great deal of different armed forces. And what's been changed is the use of the application of tritium. Now conventionally, tritium, like radium, was simply painted onto the dial, and this was the, the undisputed way of doing it. Admittedly, this was sometimes put into, into um, a white gold surrounds, for example, or steel surrounds, in the form of applied markers, and this is seen in some of the 1980s Rolexes. However, the tritium tube really is the way things have gone forward. Because the tritium tube is the concept of, re of retaining tritium as a gas rather than turning it into a paint, and by so doing, encasing it in a small glass vial. And these would simply be made out of uh, some sort of uh, borosilicate glass, which was then coated with zilc sulphide in order to, to allow the, uh, the, the tritium inside to glow. And these are, are applied to the dials of watches, or indeed to the hands, and have become very, very famous with, with brands such as Marathon, where they're applied to the hands um, and provide extremely legible pieces of equipment, which don't provide any of the health, health risks that, uh, that conventional tritium would, and al albeit those health risks are re re relatively minimal. Here you have a, a real, real complete safety from these as, as a result of that, that encased nature in those tritium glass tubes. And these days, this is the only way of getting a, an all-time glowing watch. And I say this because uh, tritium from the 1960s, for example, all the way until the 1980s, by now no longer glows. And likewise, though radium dials from the 1930s and 40s is still um, a, a highly radioactive substance and certainly hasn't lost any of its, potence, its potency, it has destroyed over time as a result of its, um, its high radioactivity. It's destroyed the agent that it would have been, um, been painted with that would have converted that radioactivity into light. And so as a result, uh, this is really the only way of getting hold of a watch which glows perpetually. And in my eyes, it's a very, very appealing way of getting hold of it. And these do allow you a legibility which is unparalleled in terms of working at all times, and don't provide you any, with anything near the brightness of, of, um, or of more modern styles of, um, of illumination, which I'll talk about in a moment but does provide you with this, this uh, total um, darkness uh, function, which means that at any time of day, really, um, or, or night, irrespective of whether the watch has been in the dark for months, it will still glow. One brilliant aspect of tritium is the fact that when it's illuminated in tubes, a lot of brands have taken advantage of the fact that depending upon the colour of the glass and indeed the substrate um, onto which the tritium is, um, is applied in its gas form, it means that you can modulate the, the colour of this, uh, the, this form in order to be able to segment different parts of your dial. And this works extremely well in terms of being able to make very complex dialed sports watches highly legible in the dark without simply having a, um, a sea of uh, like uh, and similarly coloured uh, paints. And as a result, watches um, of a more technical type, such as pilot swatches and dive watches, really do benefit from this technology, with uh, blues, yellows, greens, even reds in this tritium illumination, which, thanks to their continual illumination without the, the fading that, uh, that more modern styles of loom would have, this means that you can very quickly and easily pick out the different colours and read the watch more quickly. Now, 1993 sees a major revolution in the way watches are illuminated. And this is with Nomoto uh, and, uh, and Co., which is a manufacturer in Japan who came up with a, a, a self-illuminating style of material, which is, is illuminated and charged, if you will, by surrounding ambient light, and then of course when that light is removed, it glows. Crucially, the lack of safety concerns with this material meant that it could be used in, in a great many different applications, as a result it was of, of it being made of strontium aluminate. And this wasn't radioactive, and so as a result, large quantities of it could be used without any real concern, 
because the idea of manufacturing a sign um, which was uh, covered with this, uh, with, with, with radium, for example, would firstly be shockingly expensive, but also in this modern world be simply um, ethically completely immoral. So as a result, this was seen in, in everything really, from watch dials all the way through to, um, to, to signs to, to show on uh, safety tips during a fire. By the late 1990s, a great deal of, of Swiss brands um, had already adopted this, this style of, of illumination. For example, Rolex adopted it in 1998 with their simply Swiss-marked dials. And though some other dials have been found with Luminova where they'd had some, some tritium dials left over and thus painted them with Luminova, this is generally a good marker. And as a result, this, uh, this changed the way their watches uh, worked in terms of illumination. But after just a couple of years, they realised that actually the illumination that uh, Luminova was giving them simply wasn't sufficient. Since 2000, Rolex has been using their Swiss-made dials, and these included Super Luminova, which was an improved and more long-lasting version of Luminova. And this has become an industry standard and, uh, and has been used across the board by a lot of manufacturers as a form of, um, of illumination which is safe, um, legal in all, all, all types of legislation, and also um, completely um, uh, uh, timeless in terms of its, its decay, because whereas tritium will, uh, we will slowly disappear in, into nothing, this will continue, continue to work provided with light for a very, very long time without, uh, without coming apart. Of course, Superluminova comes in a variety of different colours and styles, from C3, which is probably the brightest and most well-known, which glows a very vivid green and is slightly off-white when it's, when it's painted onto the dial, to C1, which also glows a, a green, though slightly less pronounced than C3, but does, does appear more white, and BGW9, which appears white but glows a crisp ice blue. And this comes in a variety of different variations, um, and, and this is really just, just the, most, the three most popular, whilst a great number of other styles in all sorts of colours have been produced, even black Luminova is produced. And so, as a result, it's a very versatile product and is used by the vast majority of brands to illuminate their timepieces. Of course, certain brands have chosen to go their own way with regards to Superluminova, with Rolex in 2008 choosing to create their own chromolite with this, this crisp blue, whilst also Seiko have used Lumibrite, which is their own proprietary compound, to give an incredibly bright style of, of illumination on, on dive watches such as the Tuna. And so as a result, each brand does take its own approach, and then likewise Omega, for instance, uses a dual colour style of luminescence on its Seamasters to give a, a green on the minute hand and the, the, the loomed bezel, and then blue for the rest of the dial, which is an interesting touch and I think does help with legibility. But certainly this is very much the, the end of this story of, uh, of watch luminescence moving from radium to, tr to tritium to tritium tubes, all the way to Luminova in its various forms. And of course this is a story which continues to evolve as brands try different methods of, of illumination. And there are also electrical illuminations, um, which I, I haven't included in this video because I was talking more about the chemical side of things. But certainly there are electrical illuminations um, such as uh, Timex's uh, Indiglo style of, of, of uh, luminescence, which again are other ways of, of, of showing at the time in the dark. But certainly I hope this video has been informative and interesting. And if you did enjoy the video then please do leave your comments down below as to what you thought. And do please like, share and subscribe to help the channel and to be able to enjoy my content here in the future. So thank you very much for watching. This is Arm on the Watch Guy, out.